And then I guess now you also see my uh, presentation, I hope. Yes. Okay, great, thanks. So um, I don't know how we did it last time, uh, but I think we're with a sizable group, but not uh, super many. So I think it's, it, as far as I'm concerned, it's fine if people just unmute themselves and ask questions throughout. Uh, that would make it a little bit lively because right now I'm only seeing Lars, uh, uh, Lars's face. Otherwise, I cannot see my slides. So first of all, thanks of all, uh, thanks for inviting me, Lars, uh, uh, to this wonderful place. Uh, um, and so I'll talk about uh, um, basically some, as Lars said, some hydrodynamic, so fluid-like aspects uh, of uh, spin transport. So this will be about non-local spin transport through magnetic insulators and. I kind of, um, my aim is first of all, to kind of just explain you what such an experiment or setup actually means. And then uh, the second part of the talk, the second half, I will try to answer the question, what we would observe if we do such an experiment on uh, viscous magnon fluid. So this work has been mostly done by uh, Camilo Ulloa, a PhD student who graduated uh, uh, earlier this year uh, in June. Uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, the theory group of Marco Polini, who is now back in Pisa. I should actually modify this uh, slide. And also with, uh, inspired by experiments by, uh, done in the group of Bart van Wees uh, by Tuan Shen. Um, okay, so just to kind of frame the talk, uh, let me give this sort of standard uh, by now, at least from my point of view, a long-term motivation of this of this work. So the idea is to I uh, kind of try to replace superconductors with something equivalent, but then for, for spin. So for a superconductor, we don't have, uh, let's say we connect it to two metallic leads, we don't have a voltage drop across the uh, superconductor itself. So we have a Ohm's law, but then with R independent of this, this length. So the resistance is only due to uh, conversion processes uh, between the lead and the superconductor. And this all works at below room temperature. And then uh, what what, at least part of the field of spintronics would like to do is to replace such a setup based on charge to a similar setup, but then, uh, so again, with metallic leads uh, that somehow contact the system and drive it. Uh, so these will still be uh, electronic reservoirs, but then something in between, which is supposed to be a dissipation of spin conductor. Uh, you could put a spin superfluid or so, but I, I will not discuss about, uh, I will not discuss spin superfluidity right now. Uh, but the goal is to find some material that uh, has a nearly dissipationless conduction of spin. Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll say a little bit about what this could be and, uh, and kind of the idea of pursuing this is that um, uh, this might actually work above room temperature because uh, so throughout this talk I'll be discussing mostly magnetic systems, uh, uh, magnetic insulators in particular and, and kind of the dynamics is governed by at least the energy scale is the exchange, the dominant energy scale, and, uh, and this is a large energy scale, so this might all actually happen above uh, room temperature. So this is kind of the long-term motivation. Now to, to specify it a little bit more in this talk, I will mostly talk about magnetic insulators uh, and uh, magnetic insulators connected to uh, metallic reservoirs of spin. And I'll discuss in some detail what these metallic reservoirs uh, are precisely and how that works. Um, and so, as I said, uh, um, so this might happen above room temperature. That's one reason uh, to do that. And in fact, some of the experiments that are not in the dissipation is regime yet, they work uh, at room temperature. Uh, now, magnetic insulators are also interesting because they have very, they can have very low dissipation of spin. So the, um, uh, the quality factor of some magnetic insulators, so the, the amount of precessions that the magnetization can have before uh, the system reaches equilibrium, is on the order of 10,000 or even 100,000. Um, so that's one thing. So very little dissipation, very little spin relaxation. And secondly, there will be no moving electrons in whatever is transporting the spin here. So there's no conventional ohmic heating uh, um, in, in the magnetic system that I'll talk about. So now I'll go uh, step by step through how to actually do this now experimentally. Uh, and show some experiments. And then uh, uh, I'll discuss toward, uh, I'll, I'll continue towards discussing the fluid-like uh, regime. 
So how are we going to transport this spin through the magnetic insulator? So this will be done by uh, uh, spin waves, or uh, if you quantize them, magnons. So most, of, perhaps all of you will have heard about them. So this is just a reminder. Um, so they are non-conserved bosonic quasi-particles. So just linearized excitations around some equilibrium direction of the magnetization. So this is kind of the, this picture here, uh, the spin wave picture that you see here is a, an excitation around a, a collinear uh, ground state. So this is the simplest case of a spin wave. And uh, non-conserved is kind of important here. So this means that uh, uh, at least in equilibrium, the chemical potential of these uh, quasi particles will be, uh, will be zero. We'll see, however, that in the experiments that I'll discuss, uh, uh, we at least think that they are described by a non-zero uh, chemical potential for these, uh, for these magnons. Now, what is important for, for me is that these magnons transport spin angular momentum. So uh, let's say a localized magnon would be a localized uh, tilted spin, or in case it's spin one half, a localized flip spin that then spreads out to form the wave that you see in this picture here. So, uh, with respect to the saturated magnetization, this would be a reduction of spin H bar. So a magnon transports the spin uh, H bar. Now in principle, they can have a long range in, in wavelengths and, and frequencies. Uh, most of what I'll discuss is, is uh, uh, let's say, is um, magnons around uh, thermal energies, KBT, and this is most of the time for the experiments, at least uh, room temperature. Okay, so let's say the conventional way to uh, excite uh, these uh, magnons, let's say in a coherent regime, uh, uh, is just by putting antennas on top of your uh, magnetic uh, system to drive time-dependent and uh, position-dependent uh, magnetic fields. And then you can excite coherent long wavelength, so meaning micrometers, uh, long wavelength spin waves. And this is somehow uh, referred to as, uh, as the field of magnonics if you do that, even though this is kind of a misnomer because it's mostly like classical uh, spin wave physics, just like the field of nanophotonics deals with, uh, not with photons, but with classical waves. But that's just what it is. It seems that anything that ends on onyx is, is uh, fashionable. Um, so I'll, I'll be mostly talking about uh, more high energy magnons. So the thermal magnons that are there already by thermal uh, fluctuations and then how you can bias and uh, transport them from uh, one lead to the other. Um, now a typical, just to give you an example of a typical dispersion, um, ignoring dipolar interactions. These are always uh, difficult to treat, uh, but for the uh, magnons at the energies that I'll be discussing, these are also irrelevant. So for most of the time it's kind of okay to uh, approximate the magnon dispersion just by a quadratic part proportional to the, uh, of which the prefactor is proportional to the exchange interaction. Uh, so quadratic in the momentum and then a, a gap due to anisotropies, magnetic anisotropies and a uh, magnetic field. And this gap is typically, let's say on the order of a, uh, a a tenth of a Tesla, for example, or, or, or a Tesla at most. So this is kind of uh, uh, in the gigahertz uh, regime. So this is kind of the, these are the, uh, the quasi particles that it will transport the spin in the, uh, in the magnetic insulator. And then the question is, how do you actually, so I want to be able to connect this magnetic insulator to drive this spin transport electrically. Uh, so I don't want to uh, deal with time dependent magnetic fields, but I want to basically connect uh, this, this magnetic insulator to an electronic reservoir for spin. So how do you actually do this? Uh, and so most of you will know, and the answer to this question is, is the, uh, using the spin hole effect. So most of you will, uh, I think, know about the spin hole effect. Uh, so I will, this is not a talk about the spin hole effect, which in itself could span several talks, uh, I think. But this, so, I will just use the phenomenology of the spin hole effect. Um, and so uh, the spin hole effect, for those of you who have not uh, seen it before, uh, just to remind you, uh, uh, for those of you who have seen it, uh, is, is kind of the effect or by a, let's say, longitudinal charge current. So longitudinal here referring from uh, bottom to top. So I drive a charge current from bottom to top. Uh, is accompanied by a transverse spin, uh, spin current. Uh, and the spin current, uh, so basically it means that uh, up electrons, at least in this picture, up electrons go to the right. 
down electrons uh, go to the left. So this is kind of a cartoon uh, version of the uh, of the spin hole effect. Um, um, and the mechanism by which that that actually causes this is uh, is a spin orbit uh, coupling. And so kind of the spin hole uh, effect is kind of uh, at least phenomenologically equivalent, I think, to uh, shooting a uh, soccer ball with uh, spin, uh, where you also kind of influence the, the orbit with uh, the spin of the ball. Anyway, so uh, the microscopic mechanism is, is spin orbit coupling and kind of the, the most commonly used material nowadays to uh, use the spin hole effect. And with using the spin hole effect, I mean using it to create spin currents and to detect spin currents. Uh, so the most commonly used material is platinum, is a heavy element with strong spin orbit coupling. So detection of spin currents, so the spin hole effect causes spin current. Uh, the reverse of the spin hole effect, the inverse spin hole effect, the Onzaker reciprocal to the spin hole effect, uh, you can use to detect spin current because basically this uh, inverse process of the spin hole effect uh, converts a, a spin current into a, a charge current. Now, what is most important for my uh, for my talk is that um, the spin hole effect. What it does, it establishes spin accumulation. Uh, just think about it as a spin voltage. Uh, so, whenever I, uh, for example, if you look at this picture, if you if, if the material would end here on the right, then near this interface, near an, uh, an interface with something else or with vacuum, you would establish a, a spin uh, accumulation. So, a, ca a chemical potential difference between up and down electrons. Okay, so I'll, I will just take the spin hole effect uh, as uh, kind of given. Uh, you can ask me questions about it about it later, whether it's, it's good or not, uh, and then we can discuss about it. But for now, let's me just assume that uh, it works like I describe here. And as I said, most importantly, it leads to uh, the establishment of a, a spin accumulation. And then you can actually use uh, the spin hole effect to uh, inject spin current into a magnetic insulator or to detect spin current going out of a magnetic insulator. So how does this now work? Um, so the reason why this, why you can actually do this now is because uh, uh, let's say in a, if you make a heterostructure, so remember the goal is to make a kind of electronic reservoir for spin current that flows into and out of a insulator, magnetic insulator. And so Let's say on this picture here, on the right, I have my magnetic insulator. On the left here, I have uh, a metal. And I want to be able to inject spin from left to right. However, I cannot do that by driving a charge current from left to right, because there's, uh, the, the system on the right here is an insulator. Uh, and actually, the, the magnetic insulator that I'll talk about concretely has a band gap of several uh, EV. So it's, it's really an insulator. Um, so it, I cannot use kind of a spin polarized current that I get from a ferromagnetic metal to inject into this magnetic insulator. However, what I can do is I can drive a charge current tangential to this interface, uh, as indicated here with this uh, cartoonish battery. Uh, so it's, it's completely fine to flow a charge current, let's say, into the screen on this picture. Uh, and this charge current will set up a uh, transverse spin current if uh, this is a strong spin orbit coupling material. So this will be uh, platinum in, in, the, in the, the specific case, uh, in, the, in the experiments I'll talk about. Um, and this then sets up a, a spin current. And this spin current can flow towards the interface. Uh, so the spin up electrons uh, can flow towards the interface, reflect, uh, bounce off the interface, reflect uh, back as spin down electrons. And if they do that, they actually deposit uh, spin angular momentum H bar right at this interface that is absorbed by uh, a magnon in the magnetic insulator. So this is a way to set up a spin current that travels across the interface from the paramagnetic metal uh, into the magnetic insulator. So there's a flow of spin current across this interface, even though there's no charge flow across this interface. The charge flow is only parallel, tangential to this interface. Now, in principle, you could also bias this system with uh, uh, temperature differences. I will not go into detail about that, but that is something that's usually referred to as the spin Zewick effect. Um, and that has also it, it received a lot of attention. Okay, so this is kind of now the way to, uh, uh, to inject spin current into a magnetic insulator. Now, if you want to 
think about it a little bit more microscopically, what you have to uh, consider is to consider an interface exchange coupling uh, between the electrons in this uh, metal on the left, the platinum, and the uh, uh, magnons on the right. Um, and this interface exchange coupling, actually, if you quantize it, you precisely get scattering, uh, you, you precisely get interaction terms by which a spin flip uh, creates or uh, absorbs a magnon uh, in the magnetic insulators. And then, and then somehow the, the, the strength of this coupling is determined by, um, uh, or the matrix elements of this coupling are determined by the interface uh, exchange. Okay, so this is kind of the, 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 the way that uh, in experiments, uh, um, uh, you can actually make, let's say a reservoir, electronic spin reservoir for biasing a magnetic insulator. And then, uh, so this is all about, let's say injection of spin current, but the kind of reverse process also happens by which a, uh, let's say a spin H bar leaves the magnetic insulator, is converted with the inverse uh, spin hole effect into a uh, uh, transverse uh, charge current that you can detect uh, simply with a voltmeter. Okay, so um, so let's for now assume that, it, that this works. Um, yeah. Uh, may I ask, so what is the typical efficiency of that? So when I inject the spin current and then on the other hand, I take it out again. Uh, I mean, how kind of how, what percentage of the original uh, signal is still there? Yeah, this, so this is, uh, um, yeah, this is somewhat of a, uh, let's say in the context of the experiments that I'm going to talk about is somewhat of a, let's say at the level of spin is, uh, uh, it would be a hundred percent because the interface exchange coupling conserves spin. Um, however, there's a certain efficiency associated with, uh, first of all, if you think back in terms of charge, um, then there's a certain efficiency of converting charge to spin current in the, uh, in the system on the left here. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one thing. And this is typically on the order of 5%. So the so-called spin hole angle. So the, 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 the ratio between spin current and charge current, if you express them in the same units, is around 5% for platinum. Mm -hmm. So 5% of the charge current is converted into transverse spin current. However, at the interface, the spin is conserved. So this, uh, this, so in terms of a single spin, it's a hundred percent efficient, so to say. But then um, you have to kind of average over all such processes, and this leads to a finite spin resistance. But mm -hmm. but it's still a conserved current across the interface. The interface is atomically thin, so no spin is. Uh, well, let's say. In principle, spin could be lost there, but that's uh, uh, typically not taken into account. And there's also um, uh, no evidence that that's a big effect. There will be spin lost again in the bulk of the insulator uh, due to relaxation processes. So I will come back to that. Okay. Maybe uh, if I will kind of answer your question when I discuss the experiments and then I think uh, that, that gives for an easier picture to answer your question with. If I, if I don't do that, then just remind me. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so I just want to uh, kind of go to the simplest setup uh, that you could use um, um, with this. So, so kind of a two terminal setup um, where you now have, uh, let's say, an, an electronic reservoir on the left. Uh, that you somehow bias to give a, to get a non-equilibrium spin accumulation near the interface. So this will be this mu as L on the left. So the, 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 the voltage of the spin battery, we will. Then on the right, we will do the same. However, uh, typically we'll, we'll take the left one as the injector. So we'll, we'll establish a non-equilibrium spin accumulation on the left here. And on the right, we'll just uh, assume that the spin accumulation is zero. So we'll just be interested in the amount of spin current that goes in there. Uh, and that is then converted to, to a, a voltage or a charge current to be picked up. Okay, so in the simplest case, these, uh, um, um, uh, let's say the simplest thing that would happen in the uh, ferromagnet would be uh, if the uh, magnons uh, have um, a lot of momentum relaxation such that they uh, behave diffusively. Um, 
And so then uh, uh, basically I would have a, a continuity equation for the magnons uh, um, and a constituent equation expressing the magnon current or the spin current in terms of the gradient of the spin density um, with a certain diffusion constant. Uh, and then on top of this uh, uh, conservation law, because spin is not truly conserved, um, I would have uh, some uh, magnetization relaxation. So this m -har means magnetization relaxation and MOM means momentum relaxation. Uh, sorry that I, I realize now that this can be kind of confusing. Uh, uh, sorry for that. And so the little bit of spin relaxation will be kind of uh, 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 described by this relaxation term. So if you uh, now solve the, uh, the equations that in the steady state, you'll find that these two equations define a typical length scale uh, which is uh, which is given here. Um, um, so this is called the Magnon spin diffusion length or the spin diffusion length. So it's a typical length scale over which the Magnon spins uh, disappear, over which the spin disappears. And it's kind of the square root of momentum relaxation and magnetization relaxation because uh, I've, I've assumed here, or I've, I've taken here the, the, the diffusion constant to be proportional to momentum relaxation constant. Okay, so uh, what I've also done, uh, and that's what you see here. So because we're driving the system electrically, we're, 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 we're kind of establishing a spin chemical potential in these uh, metals using the spin hole effect. I'm also describing the response of the system in terms of a um, uh, chemical potential. So in equilibrium, as I mentioned before, the chemical potential of the magnons would be um, zero. However, injection of magnons brings the system, the magnon system out of equilibrium. Uh, and this you can then incorporate in two ways by, um, well, in many ways, but let's say the simplest ways would be an elevated temperature or an elevated chemical potential. Um, I've chosen here to uh, uh, incorporate the, the, the kind of the out of equilibrium nature of the, uh, the biased magnon system with a chemical potential. And this is based on, uh, uh, on the fact that the magnetization relaxation is very small, whereas, this, the, 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 whereas the, um, um, the processes that, um, let's say, equilibrate uh, magnon and phonon temperatures. So this, this magnon system is, of course, living on top of a, uh, in a phonon environment. So these time scales are very fast. So the, 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 the magnon temperature will quickly equilibrate to the phonon temperature, uh, a bit quickly, I mean quickly in time, but also in particular over a short distance away from this interface. And secondly, the, the, um, the magnon, let's say the interactions between magnons themselves are dominated by exchange, and they are uh, the fastest time scale in this problem. Uh, and they will actually establish equilibrium um, within the magnon systems before the magnons can uh, relax to the uh, to the underlying lattice, so that's why um, I will get go back uh, to some of these uh, time scales and length scales later on in the talk. But that's one reason for uh, describing the magnetic insulator uh, with a uh, um, let's say a magnon spin accumulation or magnon chemical potential. In principle, you could do both, or you could go further. Uh, you could let's say both include a temperature and a chemical potential. But here, I've taken only the chemical potential. Okay, so um, so this would be this would this equation would describe the bulk, and then you would have to connect them to the leads with some uh, boundary conditions. And these boundary conditions usually are formulated in terms of an interface resistance that is associated uh, uh, that is yielded by these processes whereby you convert electrons uh, electron spins into uh, uh, magnons on the other side. So I, I will not go into detail here, but there's some uh, uh, well-defined interface resistances that you can actually uh, determine to see how uh, what is kind of the drop of uh, spin chemical potential, if you will, across the interface. Now, does this now also work in, uh, in an experiment? Uh, that's, I think, at this point, the most important question. And the answer is, uh, seems to be yes. So these are now experiments uh, in the, uh, by Bart von Weiss. Um, uh, done by Ludo Cornelissen in the group of Bart von Weiss. And so this is kind of the cartoon, let's say the, the this is the picture that you kind of sent together with your uh, submission to uh, 
tease the editor. So what, what is what is shown here is uh, um, kind of the schematic of, 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 of the experiment. So you have kind of a, a strong spin orbit coupled metal. Uh, so charge current in this direction, tangential to the interface, spin current in this direction, electronic. And at the interface, you excite the magnon, and then at the other end, the reverse process happened. Now, this picture is slightly misleading in the sense that what this suggests is that you excite one magnon at a time. Uh, so I think the appropriate way to think about these experiments is that you somehow have a, uh, let's say, a thermal cloud of magnons, so just the magnons that are there uh, because of thermal fluctuations. So this is actually all at room temperature. And these magnons are slightly biased, so brought out of equilibrium by the injection of spin current. Um, and we actually, in these experiments, I don't have pictures on that uh, to show that, but these experiments actually turn out to be in the linear response regime. So you uh, really are kind of biasing the magnon system. So this is kind of the schematic. So this is how the actual device looks like. So this black stuff is the magnetic insulator uh, yttrium iron garnet, uh, YIG, Y-I-G. Um, this is kind of the workhorse for a lot of stuff uh, that is going on in this community. Um, then on top of this magnetic insulator, there are strips. So these, these lines here are strips of platinum. So these are the, uh, the metallic reservoirs uh, in which I, in which one, uh, the experimentalist, I should say, uh, excite the spin accumulation, uh, excite the spins, uh, the electronic spins and detect the, uh, using the inverse spin all effect, the electronic spin currents. And then kind of the experiment that they do is really a non-local experiment. Uh, so that's why this is referred to as non-local spin transport, even though from the point of view of spin transport, it's kind of a two-terminal uh, setup. Uh, so it's non-local in the sense that you have, uh, from the charge point of view, you have four contacts. So you have, a, let's say, a current that you drive to this platinum strip on the left here. So a charge current, and then you detect a voltage across the, uh, um, uh, the uh, let's say a voltage drop across the, over the right platinum strip. Uh, and then, question here, Rembert. So yes. In this experiment, the, the spin current is going from left to right. Yes. Uh, so which is, of course, much, much smaller than the distance that the charge current is, so it has a long time to accumulate. Is the idea in the future that this L, this distance, will increase by various techniques? Yeah, so I will actually show results on various distances L, because this gives information on the, on the decay length. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, so there are also experiments. So, the, so the reason, so there are various reasons for this precise geometry. First of all, just experimentally, it's easy to to. Um, so this yik is kind of a, a hard uh, material to make yourself. So you basically, what they do is they buy uh, films of yik and they deposit stuff on top. So that's why these platinum leads are kind of on top of the magnetic insulator. So there are some groups now also able to really make sandwiches of. Uh, uh, to make to go really to let's say um, quasi one dimensional structures for example anyway so um, where was I anyway so the, so the, this is kind of the basic setup of the experiment and then let's say an observable of this experiment would just be this voltage that you measure here divided by the current uh, so this is by definition a non local voltage and since this is a uh, an insulator uh, in principle you expect to measure uh, nothing, uh, so these 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 uh, um, strips are further apart than uh, than uh, in, in typical Coulomb drag experiments, much further. So you expect to see nothing, but uh, of course I do see something because of these spin dependent processes that are going on. Namely, they measure. So this is now the experimental result, and this is now to come back to your question, uh, Mika. This is now a, uh, a result of this non-local voltage uh, as a function of the distance between these two uh, between injector and detector here and so what you see uh, here is that uh, for long distances there's um, an exponential decay of the signal so there's a logarithmic scale an exponential decay of the of the signal uh, from which you can extract a uh, decay length um, so let me remind you, I, uh, we expect the spin accumulation or the spin to decay exponentially with this uh, spin diffusion length. So also the 
this means that also the non-local resistance will decay with injector detector distance in this in the same way. And if you uh, uh, extract now experimentally this length, this is 10 uh, micrometer. Uh, and this is kind of to some extent amazing. So this was the fir first experiment of its kind. Uh, and and uh, this immediately kind of rivaled the spin diffusion length in graphene. So the electronic spin diffusion length in graphene. So these magnetic insulators are really good uh, spin conserving uh, spin conductors. Now to come back to Dirk's question, um, perhaps I already answered it. So if you look at this, let's say the, the, the voltage to, so the ratio of voltage to, uh, um, to current. Um, so this ratio is small by a factor of the spin hole angle squared, for example. So because there's a conversion of, of uh, at least in the interpretation of the experiment, uh, there's, a, there's a charge to spin co conversion process twice uh, uh, with the injection and detection. And so that gives you like uh, 0 0.05 squared uh, as a prefactor of all this. Um, yeah, so this, this, this is how you can think about uh, an efficiency, let's say. If you think about efficiency in terms of spin transport, then it's actually uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, good, I would say. But if you take into account the charge to spin conversion, it's of course not so uh, attractive. Okay, so this is how the experiment, uh, the basic experiment works. So the, 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 the experiment that I discuss here, uh, so we really think about this in terms of uh, diffusive magnon transport. So these are long length scales, uh, right? So the, 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 we really think that's, that at least for these long length scales, um, uh, the magnons uh, scatter uh, with uh, mostly phonons. That's actually the, 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 uh, what we believe is going on here. Uh, but the question is now what would happen uh, and that's the what I, what I will discuss in the second uh, uh, part of the talk which will uh, I think not take as much time as the first part but uh, um, that is what would be now the signature in these type of experiments um, if the magnons would actually uh, um, be hydrodynamic in the t in terms of uh, uh, be, fl be fluid like so um, if their momentum would uh, would not scatter uh, so much. So uh, how would that show up in these non-local spin transport experiments? And so there's, there's two motivations for looking at this. Um, well, actually three. Uh, so one was actually some obscure sign changes in the experiment. Uh, I do think those are, so I don't have any results on that because I think in hindsight, those were not related to hydrodynamic behavior, but just our lack of understanding these sign changes uh, motivated us to think about uh, possible directions and, and hydrodynamics or fluid-like behavior was one of them. Uh, the other motivation is just the, the, the ongoing developments with electronic uh, um, hydrodynamic systems that we heard about uh, two weeks ago in this, uh, in this seminar. Uh, also dealing with kind of non-local setups um, um, as shown here, so I'll not say much much more about it because you can just watch the recording of uh, the excellent talk of, uh, talk of two weeks ago. Another motivation is that there were recently, actually in history, uh, in the 70s, and also more recently, some proposals for uh, magnon fluid dynamics. So here's just one recent result by uh, uh, Joaquin Rodriguez Neva, uh, working with Eugene Demler, um, and they actually looked at uh, just the Heisenberg model and ask myself the question if there's a regime where you can actually observe sound of uh, magnons. And so this is a result on the magnon spectral function where they identify a, uh, a sound, uh, a hydrodynamic sound mode. Uh, and so this is kind of bulk, uh, let's say bulk hydrodynamic behavior. To probe this, you would need to measure this. Uh, um, um, so this is spin susceptibility. Um, and so in our work, we wanted to look at, we were interested in what is now the, let's say the transport signature of this, uh, of, of uh, magnon fluid-like behavior. So of magnon viscosity uh, in the spin transport. Um, and so basically the take home message is that you can identify in principle these, the, this hydrodynamic uh, behavior in, in, in pretty much the same way as for electrons. So there are some sign changes in this non-local spin uh, signal. So that I'll discuss in the coming uh, few minutes. So how do we now model this? So, um, um, so the idea is, um, so if, we, if let's say the magnum-magnum collisions are uh, faster than the momentum relaxation length uh, 
um, um, sorry, in momentum relaxation time, uh, which is probably in these systems the, the, mag uh, the dominated by the magnon phonon interaction. Then for uh, short time scales and short length scales, or let's say for, for uh, short length scales, we can describe the system by uh, fluid dynamics and we have to take into account the viscosity of the magnons just in, in the same way as we did for, uh, as one does for electronic systems. And so, um, so how does this work? Uh, so previously I had spin conservation laws, uh, or quasi conservation laws. So we had them, that's now, slightly rephrased. So this is now the magnon number conservation. So these are the two linearized uh, hydrodynamic equations. So previously I already had spin conservation. Uh, so this is now the magnon number conservation uh, um, equation here. And now um, instead of having a constituent equation uh, that gives me ultimately a diffusion equation uh, or a diffusion relaxation equation. In this case, I have to add a, a momentum conservation equation. So the Navier-Stokes equation for the velocity, uh, the Magnon uh, drift velocity. Uh, so it's very much the same as the, uh, let's say an ordinary fluid equation. Um, like in the case of electrons, we also add next to the uh, spin relaxation, we also add momentum relaxation to be able to kind of uh, um, take into account the crossover from the fluid-like regime to the diffusive regime. And this then gives rise to two length scales. So one is the spin uh, um, diffusion length that I discussed earlier, this LM, which is, on the order of, which is long on the order of 10 micrometer. The other one is now momentum relaxation length. Um, that uh, um, turns out to be uh, much smaller, but still uh, not ridiculously small. So this is on the order of, of uh, at most, uh, well, it can be between one and a hundred uh, nanometers. Um, so I don't take into account here the, the energy of the magnon system. Uh, and this is just for simplicity. I think in principle, we should also take into account the, the uh, energy as a conserved quantity. Uh, but then it gets uh, uh, much harder. And typically in experiment, they are able to, uh, at least in terms of excitation and detection, able to distinguish uh, heat from spin transport. Okay, so uh, just a little- Remember, can I, can I stop you for a sec? Sure. Uh, hey, uh, so how come, uh, you know, landau lifshitz type of an equation is not part of all this? Sorry? How come it's just now? Uh, how come Landau Lifshitz type of an equation is not part of this uh, set of the equations that you're uh, talking about, or it's equivalent actually to? Uh, no, to I, that? Would, I uh, so that's a good question. I would say um, right. So Landau Lifshitz would have. It yeah, depends. It depends a little bit on what you call with Landa, what you mean precisely with Landau Lifshitz. But uh, uh, so first of all, we have to have some magnons there already, so some thermal magnons. So you would have le at least have to put some suggestive, fl uh, some noise in the landau lifshitz gilbert <laughs> equation. Uh, that's one thing. And then secondly, the, the landau lifshitz equation replaces all relaxation processes with a single constant alpha, right? So in, in the sure. in the landau lifshitz gilbert equation, all these relaxation times and, and the length scales would all be the same. Uh, and here I want to, kind of separately take um, uh, magnum, magnum, magnum phone. I want to kind of be able to treat them separately. No, I understand that, but uh, what I'm thinking about really is the hierarchy of equations here, right? So the magnum dispersion that you quoted comes yeah. from, in principle, uh, Landau-Lifshitz equation, right? Sure. So is that somehow the, you know, uh, underlying equation from which you got magnets, but then they live their own life. And that's like on top of that, essentially. Yeah. No, I, I th I, I'm thinking, so I think Landau Lipschitz equation uh, is not good for also treating things like magnon magnon interactions properly at the quantum level. So I want to also be able, I mean, most, so uh, let's say, in, if you think in terms of hierarchy, I, I'm thinking more about, Let's say starting with a Hamiltonian, doing Holstein Primakov, and then looking at Boltzmann equations for Magnon. So that that would be more my kind of going from microscopic to uh, to where I'm now, and then taking moments of a Boltzmann equation. So the reason, if if you if you kind of 
if you want to get collision terms out of a uh, of the London Leafs Gilbert equation, you you don't get correct bows enhancements factors and these kind of things. So I think you shouldn't do that basically. So I think. But, uh, okay, okay, okay. So let let me not uh, let me not waste time anymore. But at least Lando Lipschitz uh, equation is expected in this context. So you you may say I will tweak it a little bit and then it'll work. But then you just say okay. It, it doesn't do. It doesn't give me what I want. So I will dump it all together, uh, ditch no, it all no, together, I mean, and, and I mean the London leaf sheet is still correct to describe, uh, let's say, magnetization to describe the low energy tail of what I'm saying, but but not uh, not the uh, let's say magnons with energies around KBT. Uh, ah, okay, 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 okay. No, no, this I, I can understand actually. Okay, so it's kind of like the Rayleigh genes limit of what I'm saying. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, fine, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Good to hear you, by the way, Dima. It's been a long time. Uh, uh, likewise, likewise. Um, anyway, so just to uh, continue uh, here. Uh, so just a little bit more details on what we uh, what we actually do. So we're looking at a steady state. So we're solving steady state uh, Navier-Stokes equation. Now reformulated in terms of a uh, of the spin current itself, and a uh, spin um, let's say quasi continuity equation. Navier-Stokes, of course, also with a momentum uh, relaxing term. And then these are kind of the boundary conditions that I alluded to earlier. So we have. Uh, um, so let's say the injection of the spin current from let's say a lead to a uh, metallic lead to the uh, uh, magnetic insulator is uh, is given by a uh, is, is described an interface conductance or resistance spin conductance or resistance times a spin accumulation difference and then the same for the detector and then for the detector we put the uh, spin accumulation equal to zero and this interface Spin conductance uh, is, is usually kind of experimentally very well, uh, uh, um, like you can measure it with some separate experiments. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to provide more details, but it's kind of basically known what it is for, in this case, uh, it's an interface property. It's kind of known what it is for uh, the platinum yig interface. And then we assume that spin current everywhere else where there's not an injector or detector uh, doesn't leak out of the system. And that the tangential spin current uh, um, uh, is kind of uh, either zero if the slip length is, uh, is zero or uh, or otherwise. So we treat a slip length about which we basically don't know anything or we haven't computed anything about it. We treat it as a fit parameter. And actually it turns out, or not as a fit parameter, we treat it as a free parameter, but it turns out that our results don't really depend on it. And then the observable, so to say, is to that we calculate is the, the ratio between the current, that the spin current flowing into the detector over the, uh, the spin current that leaves the injector. Um, and this is actually proportional to this non-local resistance, which is accessible experimentally. So this is kind of what we do. And with we, I mean uh, Camilo Ulloa. Uh, so the typical results are, are, are shown here. So what we find in the, uh, let's say, so this inset is always the diffusive regime where you just have these, uh, this ordinary uh, 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 diffusive uh, flow patterns. So what we see is very much uh, um, similar to what, what you find with uh, electrons and maybe in hindsight also a little bit uh, easy to expect. So we get also these whirlpools um, and also sign changes in the magnum chemical potential. So just to zoom, zoom in that uh, a little bit more. So here you see, for example, in the lower figure, uh, as a function of, uh, let's say, this uh, x coordinate here for three different cuts uh, along the y direction, so three different distances in the y direction from the top interface, you see the chemical potential and you see these uh, sign changes close to the uh, injector in this case. Now, what is kind of most important for us is that, um, um, so this is now the non-local signal so this is basically experimentally, this would be this non-local resistance on the y-axis here as a function of distance between injector and detector, previously called L, now called uh, D. Um, so what you see here is, uh, again, for large distances, this exponential decay here. Uh, and so these are plots for various spin uh, diffusion lengths. Um, so for large distances, you see this, exp this, this exponential decay, but then as soon as the injector and detector become 
close enough, uh, so become close enough uh, in comparison to the uh, momentum relaxation length, you see a, a sign change of this non-local uh, resistance. So this is all very much the same as for the electronic system and this sign change actually turns out to be very uh, um, uh, robust and not so much depend, for example, on the value of the slip length. Okay, then some estimates for uh, where we are with uh, this insulator YIG, uh, Ethereum Iron Garnet. Um, um, so if you calculate, so, so we assume kind of that the that the magnal magnal interaction uh, is mostly determined determined by exchange, which is strong. So this, then you find something like a fraction of a picosecond. Um, so the momentum relaxation length uh, um, uh, is actually on the order of like uh, 100 uh, picoseconds. And then the relaxation, uh, the magnum relaxation, I think this is actually not completely correct. The magnum relaxation should be, uh, be longer than this, uh, uh, than this 100 picosecond. And so this is kind of, so, so we seem to be in, the, at least in terms of time scales, to be in the correct hierarchy. Uh, and then the, the kind of the length scale that follows, the length scale that follows are, are this 10 micrometers for the spin diffusion length. And then, uh, uh, so, this, this, so there's a lot of uncertainty in parameters, but uh, we find this momentum relaxation length to be between one and 100 nanometers. So one would be kind of uh, very unfortunate. Uh, 100 would be, uh, I think, experimentally observable, but they simply have not done any of these experiments for really putting, with really putting the, the, the injector and detector close to each other. And also not, they have not done many of these experiments for, for different temperatures, for example. Now, if you plug this back in and estimate the kinematic viscosity, what you find is that this is kind of, well, this is the number, but it is somewhere uh, in between kerosene and, and, uh, and palm oil for what it's, uh, for what it's worth. Okay, so this is basically my, my, what I wanted to say. I'll, I'll say a little bit more, but uh, one slide more to give you a little bit of a different flavor of hydrodynamic or fluid-like spin transport. But first, let me conclude this magnum part. Um, so the main message is somewhat that is, that these non-local spin transport experiments would also show uh, similar like the electronic systems that you're in the fluid-like regime, uh, if you're able to get there. Now, I haven't said anything about temperature uh, dependence. So most of what I did was kind of at room temperature or so. Uh, but uh, of course, the, the, the kind of the, all these different scattering mechanisms, in particular the magnum phonon and the uh, magnum magnum interaction, they have different temperature dependencies. So it seems very likely that you uh, like with electrons in graphene, could at least use temperature L also as a, a tuning parameter. Our next step for uh, uh, these for these magnetic systems is to go to, of course, to do experiments. Uh, um, also, the coupling to heat is important. Uh, I've kind of neglected that, but there's no there's no good reason that the uh, that the heat and spin transport would be decoupled in this hydrodynamic regime. Also to take into account phonons more seriously. So these materials are very clean, Yik. The substrates on which these materials live is called uh, uh, GIG, uh, gadolinium iron garnet. That's also super clean and may actually support also hydrodynamic phonon behavior. And then an obvious next step nowadays in spintronics is to do this for antiferromagnets. So I didn't say this when I discussed experimental results, but the, there, are, there are now since two years some experiments with antiferromagnets as well, where they see the same on local spin transport. Now, just to give you one slide of other types of hydrodynamic spin transport. So there's another way to do spin transport uh, in uh, hydrodynamically which is using really electron fluids. Uh, and that's uh, by using the vorticity that you could have in these electron fluids. So there are two uh, that I know of proposals, well, three maybe uh, with this most recent paper as well, proposal to do this in, uh, in, uh, in electronic systems. So one is by uh, um, uh, Saquon Kim and uh, Roberto Myers and uh, Robert Myers and Jaroslav Sekovniak, where uh, they kind of argue that if you use the same non-local setups with a spin injector and spin detector, but then use a uh, superconductor in between, S-wave superconductor, that the vortices in the superconductor also are able to transport spin from uh, left to right. And we've done something similar. We haven't precisely considered this setup, but we've, we've looked at uh, viscous electron systems with uh, spin orbit coupling, where you can also use the electron uh, vorticity uh, uh, to absorb spin 
Um, yeah, so that's kind of in these papers. And then there's also a new paper here where they considered basically the same system, uh, a similar system. Uh, now, um, so most of the hydrodynamic electron systems don't have, uh, at least graphene doesn't have strong spin orbit coupling, but there may be some other candidates. So um, let me just put on my conclusion slide again that I discussed already, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Rembe, for this nice overview. Um, are there questions? I would have one. Sure. Uh, so at some point when you discussed the experiment, you said that there is essentially some diffusive transport in the yik due to scattering of phonons. So, uh, I mean, how are the temperatures? I mean, can one do these experiments at different temperatures and analyze kind of how the, how the length scale changes with temperature? Yeah, so the, 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 right, so the, there is some, there are experiments in the same setup with, uh, which look at um, this uh, spin diffusion length, how it behaves with temperature. And, and to be honest, that's completely not understood somehow what, what precisely is happening there. Um, so it may be that at low temperatures, uh, so it may be that some, at some regimes, it's, it's actually uh, magnon umklapp scattering, which is important, uh, at least to, so there are basically two processes. So you need to uh, destroy spin. So you need to kind of spin non-conserving collisions and you need to uh, worry about how far the magnons travel. And so for one, for the latter, it may actually be at some point umklapp scattering. Um, uh, and I think at room temperature is actually phonons and precisely how this, how these two processes, or perhaps there are more, uh, how their relative important changes as a function of temperature, I don't have a good theory for um, at the moment. And this is just because YIC is, uh, is, so it's very nice from the making a uh, good magnets point of view, but its unit cell has 88 atoms or so, or 72. And so there are actually, so it's not really a ferromagnet, but a ferry magnet, there are a lot of magnum bands. So it's, Kind of as a model system, not so nice. So it's really not a uh, Heisenberg ferromagnet, so to say. Okay. Uh, I, I think I forgot to answer another question, but, uh, but the bottom line is somehow that it's the, 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 the details are messy and complicated. Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, uh, next question, please. Uh, can I can I go? Sure. Um, so, Rembert, uh, what are the collisions between magnons like? Are they more like, you know, magnons splitting into two magnons or are there are two magnons colliding and producing two more magnets? Uh, in other words, what is the non -linear, leading nonlinearity for these guys? And yeah, so what, uh, what, what depends on that uh, in, in your equations? Right, so uh, kind of I... I uh, Let's say what I assume is that, the, so let's say at, at room temperature, the energy scales are so large that for the magnon magnon interaction, uh, let's say disregarding phonons for a moment, the magnon magnon interaction, the only thing that matters is exchange. An exchange conserves, conserves spin, so then it's really two magnon in, two magnon out. If you go to lo much lower temperatures, uh, then um, let's say dipolar effects can become important. And then you can have like a zoo of scattering processes uh, where you basically have one creating three magnons, etc. So it, it becomes uh, very annoying. <laughs> but at, 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 at large, let's say if the temperature is in, a, in, is in a regime that you can forget about these dipolar effects, then it's, uh, uh, then it's relatively simple, I would say. But uh, would you write your equations the same way for for both types of because you know say two two and two collisions they would uh, they conserve energy momentum right they conserve the number of um, magnets so if it's uh, one splitting into two energy and momentum are still there but the number is different so only the continuity equation changes and that that's it or yeah so what, what changes I I think there. Are uh, it's mostly indeed the continuity equation that changes, but also um, 
So these magnons may not be magnons that carry just spin H bar anymore at low energies because of dipolar effect. So the spin is really also in the magnetic insulated and not a good quantum number anymore. So you have to kind of formulate things in terms of, uh, let's say, dressed magnons or so. So it just becomes a little bit more complicated. Uh, but I think in principle it would roughly work, I would say. But I think that the, the equation that's mostly affected is the continuity equation for sure. Great. Uh, sorry, sorry, I am kind of uh, uh, overusing my time, I think. But it, it is this, uh, it is this uh, conservation of angular momentum versus conservation of number of particles that uh, basically confuses me. That uh, in, the, in the case of particles without spin, right? Uh, angular momentum conservation basically just follows from the locality of the collision integral, right? So if they collide at a point and P is conserved, so you know, R cross P is also conserved. So in the case of magnets or particles with uh, internal angular momentum, uh, this should be more complicated, right? It should be like a, a, a separate equation for, for that. But you somehow do not write it. A separate equation uh, for? For angular momentum. Right, so I, I think you have to be a little bit careful here because uh, I think the let's say the, the the if I take the r cross of my Navier-Stokes equation this is not simply an angular momentum I can oh, right. of course of course of course right they have they have like somehow built in angular momentum which which is not the same as their number right yeah but so, also, also the, the the let's say the 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 magnon spin angular momentum is really Kind of an observable real angular momentum and i think the uh let's say the angular momentum that you have if the uh let's say because of the flow of the because of these vortices in the magnon fluid so to say that's not necessarily uh, a real angular momentum that's observable by a platinum detector or so sorry sorry my my uh, headphones stopped working for the last oh. five seconds i did not hear what you said i apologize I, I i said this the what i said is that the the uh angular momentum that is carried by the magnets the spin angular momentum um, right so that is a real angular momentum that i can observe with a platinum detector i mean modulo complication of the spin hall effect that that uh, i don't want to go into but so let's assume that that works and then we can really observe that spin angular momentum mm -hmm. but the, the the angular momentum in the fluid in the magnon fluid is not uh, necessarily observable in the same way it's not a real angle it's more like a pseudo angular momentum right no no no. i understand that Th that's what i'm asking yes how come you have a momentum conservation equation so energy you don't care about you have momentum conservation equation you have continuity equation uh why why uh, the equation for spin angular momentum is not part of this system of equations sorry i i, I think i keep asking uh, this question maybe you, you already answered it but uh, I, yeah, just so I, I, I mean in in let's say the uh if the magnons are circular so have a uh, uh so in high energy range that i'm considering uh, most of the time I think magnon number and spin are basically interchangeable if you only look at the magnon system Ah, okay. They are actually the same. Yeah. Uh. This is not true uh, anymore if you go to uh, lower energies where you also, uh, yeah, if you had considered dipolar effects or effects of an isotropy and lower energy. So I don't know okay, if that thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Right. Mm -hmm. Are there more questions? May I ask a very short question regarding length scales. So this picture that you now have here, Ambert, is, is very uh, suggestive that there is some anisotropy in the directionality at, at short length scales. So I'm just wondering, the experiments that were measuring the spin diffusion length, I mean, if you were to draw those lengths in this picture, are they actually on the plot or are they a lot further away? So the... Um... For this particular picture, I think the momentum relaxation length is comparable to D and the, uh, let's say the, um, so W doesn't matter so much and the spin relaxation length is kind of uh, much larger than what you see here. Right. Yeah, because in those early plots you showed, there was some weird behavior in the beginning before the spin, you could really measure spin diffusion lengths. There was this blue and red. Yeah, okay, that's, uh, you mean, 
Oops, uh, where is it? You mean this picture? Yeah. Right, so this blue and red is just two different, if I'm not mistaken, uh, two different uh, series of samples. But uh, basically what you have for the short distances is that, so this exponential decay only kicks in um, at a large, le larger length scale. So in the beginning, uh, well, it, it, it's, it's more complicated than just this. There's some prefactor such that uh, for small distances, it goes like one over uh, L actually. Mm. And that's what you see here. Because for short distances, you you don't have relaxation, and then it's uh, diffusive, which or let's say not diffusive, but then the magnons are uh, conserved. No, sorry, it is diffusive. The magnons are conserved, and then you have one over L basically. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there further questions? I, actually, I would like to to ask one, if yeah. you don't mind. Uh, it's concerning the model, the hydrodynamic model that you have for, for the, this fluid. Yeah. Um, so I'm a bit confused when it comes to maybe even to thermodynamics of this, uh, of this magnons. Because uh, you said that they are compressible, right? Um, but then the pressure is directly linked to chemical potential. And I would expect for a compressible fluid that there should be some thermodynamic relation between the pressure and, and some kind of density. Um, yeah, but I think, um, let's say this, since we kind of assume to be close to equilibrium, I think, uh, let's say we don't, so we always linearize around equilibrium somehow. So we, uh, I think those, that I, don't, I don't know if I'm, understanding your question completely, but uh, at least then, then uh, we can just compute these relations uh, without separately putting in the magnum number of so. Um, so there is a certain, uh, well, maybe maybe you can ask a further question, but uh, that's at least how I should. It's a question uh, about sound velocity. What is the sound velocity for magnums? Say again? It's, it's a question about sound velocity. Right, right. So with the sound velocity, let's say that the, so it doesn't, it depends only on the, um, so, the, well, let's say that because we linearize around a true equilibrium and then the magnon number, uh, let's say you only have temperature to characterize the system in true equilibrium. And so it will depend only on temperature. What precise expression is, I don't know at this point, but uh, we, we didn't look at that. Okay. So does that answer your question or? Yeah, I think I think that, and also maybe one more connected to compressibility. You have another viscosity coefficient, right? The, the yeah, yeah. Like uh, I write it down here, but to be honest, we we neglect it later on. Uh, oh, okay, I yeah. see. Yeah, that's what I was wondering if if it somehow enters. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any further questions? No. I was going to put on my uh, inclusion slide again. And now I have we've shown you all the hidden slides. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, it's also getting late a bit. So let me first first thank you again. Yeah. For this talk. Thank, thank you. Thanks for the question. And uh, nice, uh, nice to see some of you again. And let me also just uh, yeah, seize the opportunity to wish everybody a nice uh, Christmas break. Happy New Year. And I, I hope to see most of you back. Um, yeah, we're starting at the 7th of January, I think. And uh, the, uh, the speaker you've already seen, uh, that will be Dima Pazin. And um, I forgot what he's going to talk about right now, uh, but I will send around. I actually, I actually didn't tell you. I apologize for that. <laughs> I will. Why, I will. Why you, you sent me the paper. All right. That's right. But you didn't send me title abstract. That's great. That's, great. Sorry about that. Uh, no you problem. meant just to take it from the paper, probably, Lars. Yeah, that is <laughs> my go to move now. But. Uh, any, anyways, um, so uh, I will send around a, a, a reminder and I, I hope to see many of you back. And uh, yeah, have a great evening, day, whatever it is for you. <laughs> Happy holidays, guys. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Cheers. Cheers.